Steve Kim with Max Boxing, and once again, we are joined by Larry Merchant of HBO Sports. Larry, thank you for joining us once again. About a week and a half ago, December 6th, Manny Pacquiao was supposed to be David against Goliath, yet he absolutely pummeled Oscar De La Hoya over eight rounds. Larry, were you stunned by the sheer dominance of the Pac-Man? Didn't David beat Goliath? <laughs> Not that badly, though. Not that uh, badly. Yeah, I was, I was very surprised. Uh, surprised mainly because I had watched the evolution of Pacquiao from just, you know, a pure force of nature who could overwhelm guys his own size and had watched him become a better boxer, puncher. But I hadn't realized that he could uh, put on such a masterpiece of its kind of movement, of not getting careless in the ring, of being patient, of taking advantage of his advantages. Uh, that I was uh, totally surprised by. Larry, what does this do for Delahoy's legacy? Obviously, he's still a Hall of Famer, still had a great career, historic in terms of his uh, brand name appeal and also at the box office. How bad does this damage his historical legacy? Bonnie Ross lost to Henry Armstrong in his last fight. Bonnie Ross is still regarded as one of the best fighters of his time and so on and so forth. I measure fighters by what they do in their primes. What happens afterwards or even before doesn't matter as much as what their body of work was in their primes. And Oscar passes on that uh, test. So, Larry, you, you think this is Willie Mays in the 73 World Series. My question is this. De La Hoya, does this loss hurt him to a point where he is no longer a viable box office commodity? Probably. I would say the only opening I'm leaving there is, you know, there's some speculation in the boxing world that um, he would come back uh, for a farewell fight against Chavez Jr. That would excite uh, certainly a lot of people in the Mexican, Mexican-American uh, boxing world and would do very well. But I think... Uh, to, to do seven figures in the pay-per-view, it seems to me that uh, that's come and lingered for a long while and gone. Larry, it, let's go through the history of you as a matchmaker for Golden Boy or <laughs> the Golden Boy. Back in 2000, I don't know if people realize this, this was your idea to have Shane Mosley basically move up to face Oscar De La Hoya. This was your germination that you had an idea last year that De La Hoya should fight Manny Pacquiao. Do you get the sense, if they have a farewell fight, that Golden Boy will <laughs> not consult Larry Merchant? Um, I, I don't know. I think I'm going to quit while I'm ahead. <laughs> or, or, <laughs> uh, um, at the time, uh, you know, Shane Mosley was, was an outstanding lightweight champion. I think he had something like 30 knockouts in 32 fights or something like that and was straining to make the weight. And it had actually been a bigger amateur than Oscar. Mm -hmm. And they had sparred with each other when they were kids. And, but he was known as a lightweight champion. Oscar was just becoming Oscar. And uh, everybody thought, well, is he going to be the next Sugar Ray Leonard? And so I suggested that fight to Bob Arum. Um, and he leaped up and said, yes, just like that. Uh, because, listen, it was a local attraction, a big event, um, and Oscar thought that, like everybody else, that that was a fight he would absolutely win. And so my coming to this time, I thought, well, if it turns out the way a lot of people think, um, that Oscar is just too big and will uh, beat Pacquiao on, based on his size, that uh, I would just say to Oscar, well, I owed you one. Larry, when was the last time a promoter thanked you for making a fight like Bob Allen did? <laughs> well, I don't make that many <laughs> fights, but that was a very nice gesture um, uh, by Bob Arum. Uh, promoters have big egos. They're out there on their own trying to, to uh, uh, make something happen there. They're entrepreneurs always having to imagine the next best thing. So for him to give me credit was uh, a very nice gesture. Larry, let's talk about the winner, Manuel Pacquiao. Um, here's the thing. Is it clear 
I think we already have established for a while now, at least you did before anyone else, Manny Pacquiao is the best fighter in the world, pound for pound. Historically speaking, is he by far the best fighter ever out of Asia? Hmm. Uh, I'd have to think about that, but uh, I'd like to know another candidate. <laughs> before, uh, uh, certainly, there have been uh, there. I'm sure there have been others going back in time, but uh, in in my memory, which is uh, faulty, I'm not that big <laughs> of a boxing historian. I don't remember anybody coming out of Asia who was uh, as as uh, dominant as he was. When you look at Manny Pacquiao's future, is it logical to assume that the next big fight, whether it happens next or not, is A, either Floyd Mayweather, or B, Ricky Hatton? I think Hatton is the logical one. Um, They are, right now, the two most extraordinary fighters in the world in terms of their followings. Uh, Ricky Hatton is an amazing... uh, attraction in in Britain 1.4 million pay-per-view buys at 4 a.m. when he fought uh, Mayweather here uh, Manny Pacquiao uh, I don't know how he, how you can describe how big he is in the Philippines and among Filipino Americans so it's a, it's a it's a very big event and a logical event at 140 pounds and that to me looks like uh, the one that should happen, and then if Mayweather decides to come out of his retirement, there will be some method of comparison. Mm-hmm. Larry, Delahoya now, as you mentioned, is no longer the main marquee attraction, certainly as he was coming into December 6th. How does the game and the business now change without the specter of the Oscar De La Hoya bailout looming every single year? Well, I wouldn't call it a specter. It was always a spectacle. Mm-hmm. And the fact that he transcended boxing and was known by people who would know a left hook from third base um, is always helpful to boxing, that there's some figure out there like that. It's helpful to any sport. Um, I don't know who steps into, the, into that void. Uh, somebody will, inevitably. But right now it's up for grabs and it's up for somebody to go and claim it. I don't think, Larry, we could talk about Pacquiao De La Hoya without mentioning the guy that was also instrumental in making this fight. The trainer, Freddie Roach. We talked about this earlier in private, Larry, before. Have you ever seen a trainer who was so instrumental and so pivotal, not only in the making of a fight, but telling of the storyline that looked so prescient in hindsight? Well, it was a virtuoso performance. Um, I think it made Freddie a star, uh, which is a good thing because he's one of the good guys in the game. Uh, But I think there probably have been a few along the way. Manny, uh, Emmanuel Stewart, who I work with at HBO, has been a trainer manager. And so over the years with Tommy Hearns and others, he has helped to market the fighter, make deals and so on. But for a pure trainer, what Roach did... uh, I, I don't know anybody else uh, recently who's done anything like it. He was instrumental initially in getting him away from, from uh, people who were ripping Manny off. Farad Muhammad. And then when this fight was proposed and the two promoters got together and started to negotiate and it fell apart over percentages, he got it back on track. He goaded uh, uh, Oscar into wanting to take the fight. And then once the fight was made and the promotion was off, he was there. Um, and maybe almost a voice in the wilderness at the time of saying, my guy's going to win. Because to a lot of people, this was a cyn- just a cynical ploy to make a big event, not a serious boxing match. And he kept insisting on it. And right down to the hand wrapping before the fight, <laughs> he was looking over... Uh, Oscar's shoulder, it was a magnificent performance. Uh, not only did he predict the victory, Larry, he <laughs> called it to the round almost. <laughs> round number nine was his prediction. Larry, with all the stuff they did, he said, Oscar can't pull the trigger. I know exactly what happened in the Mayweather fight. The hand wrappings, Oscar came in light, trying to accentuate his own speed. Do you think Freddie Roach got inside the head of Oscar De La Hoya? In a way, sure. Sure. I think that Oscar, on his own, figured out that he wasn't going to get credit for the fight. Uh, because of, if he won, because of the 
height differential. And so that he decided to come as far down in weight as he could. And that he might have overtrained for the fight. So, yeah, it could be because of the, the, the there was also, you have to recall, a battle between top rank and golden boy over who was going to promote Pacquiao. Mm-hmm. That was an emotional element. Freddie had, had uh, trained Oscar for the fight with uh, Mayweather. And they were back and forthing about who had the right plan and the wrong plan. So all of those elements uh, tended to get the emotional component into the fight. Uh, The guest joining me right here is Larry Merchant, HBO Sports. And Larry, you were ringside December 6th at the MGM Grand working that event for your network, HBO Pay-Per-View. Larry, be honest. I thought Jones Calzaghe was the worst pay-per-view undercard I had seen in a while. Did this pay-per-view undercard (laughs) trump the badness of that undercard? Uh, I don't know how to measure the, the, the worst. The, maybe you need a list of the, the, the worst 10 undercards. But I think promoters have discovered over time that people come for the main event uh, uh, and they're trying to save money on the undercard and they're also trying to promote their, their young fighters. Uh, I come from the school that believes that you want to give fans a night of boxing and that very often the main event turns out to be anticlimactic. Right. But you want to give folks something to look at, maybe a hot young fighter, but something that's real good. And I just think that they've gone overboard now in using those undercards just to showcase uh, promising fighters. Now, for the record, Larry, let's let's have full disclosure. You didn't get to watch most of the undercard, did you? <laughs> you were in the locker room doing interviews. I think I saw about half a round of the undercard because we were so busy tap dancing and filling, doing interviews. I did seven interviews <laughs> on the night that uh, everything was uh, it was over and done by the time I could get back to ring. Well, ringside. half a round means you missed about <laughs> half the undercard. It didn't go on that long. Larry, my final question is, is regarding this issue then is, do you agree that the pay-per-view undercard may not necessarily sell any buys to the casual fan, but when it goes to this quality, don't you begin to alienate the hardcore fan? Well, I don't, I don't think about alienating the hardcore fan as much as I do trying to entertain the casual fan, to bring him into the tent, to make him want to see more of boxing or more of that young fighter who looked so good, or more of that veteran fighter who put on a stirring performance. Um, that's how I see it. For the, for the hardcore fan, you can't discourage him. We're all degenerates, <laughs> and we'll come back no matter what. 